Welcome to Behind the Medals, the second of three talks featuring Royal Roads faculty and other experts about the politics and values at the Sochi Winter Olympics. I'm Cleve Dinsha. I'm a sports writer for the last 32 years at the Victoria Times columnist and uh, covered a lot of uh, sports over the years, a lot of amateur sports, a lot of amateur athletes come out of this, uh, out of the island and uh, a lot of them go on to the Olympics. And so uh, I've covered a lot of Olympic athletes over the years and the games themselves. Our panelists are uh, Deanna Binder, uh, adjunct professor at the School of Leadership Studies and the author of the IOC's Olympic Values Education Program, and uh, a woman I've had the honor to do a book with on the Olympics uh, uh, many years ago now, 1996, and uh, well-received uh, book, and uh, Deanna's input was, uh, I think, uh, crucial to the success of that book, and nobody knows the Olympics better than Deanna Binder. Uh, Michael Riel, uh, to her left, is a faculty member at the School of Communication and Culture and a media expert, I and a media and sports expert, and he's the go-to guy whenever the media needs any uh, 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 expert opinion on a story that's breaking. And uh, Michael has been uh, uh, very well respected over the years as a, as a person who the media relies on to get some expert opinion. Uh, to his left is Jennifer Walinga. Uh, she's an Olympian and uh, world champion and a former rower at the highest levels uh, and so high that she went into Canada Sports Hall of Fame last year. Congratulations, Jennifer, that was great, yeah. And to her left is Marilyn T uh, Taylor, the director of the Institute for Values-Based Leadership at Royal Roads. And uh, Marilyn will give us a, a non-sporting perspective uh, through her strengths in, in leadership studies uh, about what the Olympics mean uh, culturally across beyond just sports. So welcome, everybody. I just want to get things started and ask for your opinions of the first week of the Games Pick a high and a low. What, what sort of stands out for you, uh, uh, Jennifer, of the first week? I think the, my favorite moment actually is kind of an obscure moment, but it really stuck with me because of uh, what it portrayed. I was watching the Russian skaters, the pair skaters, and the second-ranked skaters put forth probably their best performance ever. And uh, the young woman who was skating, she came up to her last jump, they nailed it, and you could see she was supposed to do this graceful move with her hand, but instead she went oh, like this with her hands, like she was kind of cheering. And I thought, there it is, you know, when you know you've nailed something and you just want to celebrate, you know, with your partner, with the crowd, and it was beautiful, and they had just laid it out. I think the, the low for me, it was this morning hearing about this um, controversy around the luge and the potential of someone messing with the temperature of the track yeah. and I think if that's true which it seems to be uh, that's quite a tragedy yeah Marilyn well I'd have to go along with uh, Jennifer on I'd have to go along with Jennifer on the uh, on the low which was um, uh, that uh, not not only that but the rumors around figure skating and deals behind yeah. the scene and it's not it, one hopes that it isn't true but even the so even the kind of reverberation of those thoughts are, are kind of, ah, yeah. Um, and, and, and I suppose the, um, the family of the Dufour. Uh, Le Point Dufour, Le Point yeah, yeah, Dufour, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, family uh, was amazing. Yeah. Uh, and such an partly because it, it's evident when you have a number of people in the same spot with, with, with so much to celebrate, it just reverberates. And, and gives meaning to a family, a community, you know, and a nation uh, supporting that tremendous uh, accomplishment. Thanks, thanks, Marilyn. Uh, Michael? Well, uh, there were lots of highlights for me, but I, I think the one that uh, uh, kind of surprised me was Sarah Burke, because that story is one I didn't know in detail, and I was wondering why are these athletes acknowledging somebody who hasn't been in the competition for a couple of years because of her tragic accident and death, and then as you get the story, you realize, oh my gosh, she was the pioneer. She yeah. was the leader. She was the advocate who would buttonhole any official from the Olympics or any other sports federation about giving recognition to uh, women's mogul skiing. And she was very successful. And so such a tragic loss. And I thought the acknowledgement of her role uh, was, was really meaningful. Yeah. The, the downside for me is a very subjective one, and that is in order to keep informed about the Olympics as a whole and to talk meaningfully with all of you and others, it's exhausting. 
And I found myself over the weekend <laughs> watching a movie. I, I couldn't, couldn't do Olympics anymore. Olympic fatigue. Anymore. I know yeah. a lot of people did that last week, just yeah. turned on something else because it was just, it's, it's too much sometimes, right? It's yeah. just, it's on 24 seven and yeah. you just need a break from it sometimes, yeah. yeah. Deanna, what sort of stands up for you for the first week? Well, I, I have to confess that my low is Don Cherry. <laughs> uh, I woke up this morning to the CBC and his comment that uh, it's gold or bust for Canadian hockey. And I travel the world trying to explain why Canadian hockey persists in teaching the wrong values. Um, why do we publicize fights? Why do kids have parents in stands that scream and yell, kill them, kill them, kill them, <laughs> to some little eight-year-old who's just wanting to be out there playing the game? So um, I think CBC's coverage has been absolutely brilliant. I wish they would put Don Cherry out to pasture, okay? <laughs> he sends the wrong messages. My high point has to be Gilmore Duino and the Danny Morrison story. Um, I don't know how these decisions are made. You have a young man who's qualified, who, who steps aside because he has this vision that, that maybe it's Denny's choice and chance. And, and there the two of them were, Gilmore with the silver medal around his neck because Denny is so grateful. It was just a beautiful story about brotherhood and comradeship in the sporting environment. So. I'll take that away with me. Yeah. Uh, to me, I think the highlight was uh, it, we come from an island where we produce a lot of summer Olympians, as Jennifer knows. Uh, she moved out here for specifically for that reason. And there are 48 island athletes at the Summer Olympics in, uh, in London. And uh, we're not a, obviously, you look outside today, it's uh, not a winter place. So we only have two uh, island athletes at Sochi. And so obviously, as a media person, you try to milk that as much as you can. Yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, yeah. one of them, uh, 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 the Spencer girl from Courtney, uh, 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 Spencer O'Brien, sorry, uh, uh, from Courtney, uh, uh, snow, uh, snowboard slope style. Uh, uh, she was world champion going in, and as often happens in these sports, I mean, you just reshuffle the deck, and everybody's capable of winning. And she made the final, and she finished 12th, and of course uh, broke down in front of the cameras, uh, uh, you know, in her post-race uh, interview. And to me, that was a highlight. Just the 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 raw emotion of that moment that uh, it suddenly hits you that uh, this is not just a regular race anymore, this is the Olympics and mm -hmm. uh, here I am. Uh, it's, uh, and I think the, just the, the, the sort of raw truth of that moment that yeah, they're <laughs> yeah, it's all about this, the camaraderie and the sportsmanship but they're, all, they're also out to win, right? And, uh, and it just hurt at that moment. And then it comes back to the sportsmanship of the moment going, well, you know, I gave it my best shot, right? And, uh, and uh, the, the, the whole over, uh, the, the overcoming the emotion of that moment, I think was the highlight for me, both the top and bottom, so uh, yeah. And then people saying, well, she was last. Well, no, she was last in the final, which is 12th best in the world. <laughs> so yeah, so I found that uh, uh, the highlight for me of the first week. So, uh, okay, and um, uh, halfway point, Canada is among the leaders, again, in winter sport. Uh, top the medals table at, uh, at Vancouver, of course, you get that hosting uh, boost. Uh, uh, that uh, every country does uh, when they host the games, but uh, the funding has stayed on over the last four years, and now Canada is again um, among the medal leaders, as it should be, uh, you would think, at a Winter Games. Uh, how important is the funding, and what are we doing well in sports? And I'd like to just start off with Marilyn. Is it important for a nation to do well in sports? Um, that's a double question for me. Um, well is the key. Um, and we've touched on it, I think, in this conversation. Uh, what does well mean? Well means terrific sportspersonship and terrific um, um, effort, uh, inspiring effort, people inspiring other people. And sport is something that's so concrete in a country or, or on, of any, in any venue. Sport is so um, concrete that it really does send those very clear messages to the population fr at all levels of interest. I mean, when you when you actually when you have Rennie Fleming singing the anthem at uh, you know at the Super Bowl, mm -hmm. for example, you're getting a picture of normally you think about opera, you know, at the t at, you know in the upper high uh, you know upper classes and football, you know, the working class, but you know it's kind of meshing, and I think. If we, if that happens, it really is a, it's it's a, it's an endeavor, yeah. a broad endeavor that brings out uh, what is there to see about the, your own nation and others. 
uh, and the international competition, I think, is really a place to learn about other countries also. The media has done a terrific job, I think, of bringing out clearly the host country. But there, when these backgrounders, you get some idea of what happens in Germany and Switzerland and, mm -hmm. you know, beyond our shores. Excellent. Uh, Michael, I just want to, you've studied this. We've had two big stories locally over the last two couple of weeks, uh, the Seattle Seahawks, which a lot of people here feel a connection to in the first Super Bowl, and just the reaction, you know, across a border uh, to a city that's near us. And now, uh, nationally, the, the the reaction across the country to uh, the Winter Olympics and the, and the medal success Canada is having there. What is it that touches a chord? Uh, what do people identify uh, with sports that makes them feel happy in their lives? I mean, they're busy doing things. But why is it important to them? Well, I think everybody here could answer that in lots of ways because it's obvious. Uh, the psychology of sports fandom to me is fascinating, particularly the degree that people kind of expose themselves, painting their faces and wearing weird get-ups that they'd never be seen in otherwise, and, and getting caught up in the fever of it. And people whose lives are pretty staid otherwise will do this. And so the, the Seahawks and Seattle and the whole region had a fabulous celebration around this, and, and who would want to miss it? Uh, so there's, there, there are all kinds of identifications, geographical ones, uh, uh, identifying with a particular sport, a particular position, uh, identifying with a team because they beat your team and you want them to show that they're the best and your team then is only second best, but very good. And you, know, you, you can identify in so many different ways and particularly if you've grown up with sports, as many of us have, there is this kind of second nature to it and it, it's an active part of your life, your yeah. whole life. Jennifer, you're the only one here among us who has actually put on a Canada jersey to do anything at international sport. Uh, what is it that transforms that experience for you? And what, uh, uh, what do you think that people see in you when you, when you put on a Canada jersey and that, that they rely so much on how you do for their own sort of edification and gratification? I think it's about hope and uh, I hardly ever use this word, but dreams. I think I, I'm just ima imagining kids. So I work with a lot of kids and I always have. And I think they, they aren't thinking about me at all. They're thinking about themselves, <laughs> which is good, which is what I want. Because they're looking at me and seeing that, okay, maybe I could do that. And I remember feeling the same way, you know, look, leafing through this 1976 Olympic book that we had for some reason. And, and it was so funny uh, looking at times for the 800 meter runner, because I figured I was going to be a runner, and thinking, I'm only a minute off, you know, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's what it is. It gives kids hope and, and uh, fuels mm -hmm. their desire and dreams. It's, it's that identification. I think people want to root for something. And, you know, frankly, I don't know if it matters who you root for. You just want to align yourself because there's some value in that in terms of, um, I think people intuitively get that we have to align and then compete in order to achieve. Like it's a collaborative yeah. thing. Right? So Deanna, you've written widely on this, uh, what the Olympics mean to society as a whole. Well, let me leap into the controversy regarding funding here for a moment. Um, you'll remember after the 1988 Calgary Games when we won only a bronze medal um, and there was this huge furor about how come we didn't win a gold medal and so they immediately implemented a, a funding program and we did incredibly well in 1992. And uh, for the Vancouver Games, they established an on-the-podium program. And I've always had a problem with the phrase. Um, I'm not sure it sends the value that it's about accomplishment and individual achievement. On the other hand, and the Olympics are always about the on the one hand, on the other hand. On the one hand, we're getting winning performances. On the other hand, are we saying to the young people who are, who are, who've had a bad day, who, who, who are not meeting their accomplishments that they failed because they didn't win the gold medal? And my bigger concern being uh, primarily interested in, in youth sport is how much funding that's going to the elite level, and it requires huge amounts of funding. I, 
won't even get into the technicalities. How much is siphoned then off from encouraging participation at the grassroots yeah, level? Point. And and I don't know the answer to the question, but it's one that I really seriously It's ask. interesting. Uh, uh, there was a sort of theme that ran through after Vancouver 2010 ended that somehow the games changed us fundamentally as a nation. And uh, that was sort of like a, a running sort of uh, storyline afterwards that now we're more American and the whole thing was now we're out to win. Jennifer, you gave me some pretty interesting quotes last week when I did a story on this. And you said this whole swagger bothers you a lot because that's not really us. It's... Uh, it's sort of, sort of a, something that's sort of been put, placed on us because now the whole idea was own the podium, not just rent the podium. You know, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, how do you feel about that whole new Cana supposed new Canadian attitude of it's, it's all out to win or nothing? Yeah, I think it is. I think the Olympics is about winning. We want to yeah. try to win because we're competing and we're in sport. So that's the goal of the, the game. The objective is to have the best time or the best whatever. Um, but it's how you win or how you strive to win and that process, whether you're, you know, creating groundwork for the, the kids who are coming behind you and that kind of thing needs to be there as well. I'd like Canada to define their own way of winning and not just absorb some other mentality. This is an interesting uh, story. When we would train in Europe, which we would do because that's where most of the countries were for our competition, we would often train with other countries, right? So we train with the Swiss, we train with the Australians, the New Zealanders, the U.S., and we got to know all these people really well because we'd hang out with them at night, right? You'd play Pictionary or charades or all these things. And it was fascinating to see people, the culture of the country come through. And the Americans would, would really tighten up. They'd be a total team. They didn't want to interact with us. It was like this. It was all about winning this game. It was really interesting, you know, just... And it was fine. I mean, yeah. that was their approach, right? The Swiss, they didn't care at all. Who won? <laughs> uh, the, the, the Brits were just out to make us laugh. Like, it was so interesting to see. So what's our so way? national characteristics do come yeah. through. They the do. Stage. And yeah. so what's yeah. our way of winning? And I think it's about hard work. I think people feel like, yeah, we do want the gold, and we'll be proud of our gold if we know we put in that work. Like, you look at Bilodeau, right? What he's yeah. put into achieving exactly, yeah. the way he thinks, the way he analyzes his former race, and then uh, puts it out there the next time. Like... And Patrick Chan, like, there's so many good examples. Yeah. I want to touch uh, on this uh, gender uh, equity issue in the Olympics. Uh, the IOC put women's ice hockey on notice last in Vancouver that unless you can have two countries capable of winning a medal, you're uh, on probation, essentially. And uh, we'll see how it goes after this. But nothing has really changed. Uh, there's Canada and the U.S., and that's it. And I think of all the athletes, especially in Summer Olympics, don't even get to qualify for the Olympics because uh, there's just the depth of field is just in track and field and swimming is just so deep. They, you have to go through a, a, a really har harsh process just to get on your national team to go to the Olympics. So, and here are a group of athletes who get to show up and basically you show up, you win a medal. Uh, is that right? And uh, in this quest for equity, has, has things gone so far one way that uh, to, to sort of make it fair, to sort of force it fair that it becomes unequal in another way. It's not really fair for athletes who really have a lot of depth of field in their, in their sport like you did in rowing, mm -hmm. as opposed to women's ice hockey Canadians who just show up and you're going to be on the podium. Deanna? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we first need to talk about what the IOC criteria are for including a sport. Uh, in the Winter Games, you have to have 45 nations who can field a team on three different continents. Now, I have a feeling they've probably stretched the rules <laughs> um, because I don't know if they have 45 countries. Uh, and certainly of those 45 countries, there's only four or five who have really strong teams. Th the counter argument to that, I'm going to let Jennifer make because there is an issue about how do you how do you develop the athletes, the female athletes that will go there? I mean, the IOC had to draw the line in the sand for Saudi Arabia and Yemen at the Summer Games in London to say, if you don't send women, you will not be mm -hmm. competing yeah. because our Olympic Charter says you must not discriminate on the basis of gender. Yeah. And so, so many of those nations originally were not they didn't allow women to participate in exactly. physical education and sport. So, Jen? Yeah, we were having a conversation earlier, and I think there's this, uh, it's a paradox, right? You, where are you going to start developing women's sport? Because there's sport, the support really isn't there, I don't think. Yeah. There are many cases that we could, uh, we could point to. So unless there are these role models, mm -hmm. Haley Wickenheiser, Cassie Campbell, you know, they've inspired how many young women to play hockey, So and yeah. probably right across the world. It seems like a form of, uh, 
uh, encouragement of some kind. Okay, we're gonna yeah. we're gonna lessen the rules a bit uh, just to have to have women's hockey, and so there will be role models, and hopefully it'll grow organically. Michael, is that yeah. a good idea? Or are, are, are rules rules that that like uh, Deanna well, says there there Adam, are harsh rules that the uh, IOC places in place for sports, and you have to have this level of interest across the world, which women's ice hockey clearly doesn't have yet. It's in the game, but at the same time, having a sport for men and not for women. Mm -hmm is a real distortion. We did a, a content analysis of the Winter Olympics before women's hockey uh, was introduced, and 70% of the airtime on television was given to male sports mm -hmm. and athletes. Yeah. But if you eliminated the male-only sports, like ice hockey, it was almost 50% coverage of, of ma male and female. Okay, yeah. So if you have a male only sport, you're really biasing what the public is going to see by way yeah. of gender. Marilyn, I'd like to ask you about it because uh, mm -hmm. your, um, your expertise in leadership. I, I know affirmative action, and essentially what this is, what this is, is a very touchy subject mm -hmm. across the board in a lot of, lot of different uh, venues. How do you feel about it? Uh, having women's sports that maybe are not widely played, but just to have them for what they can potentially do for the growth uh, uh, within themselves in the games. Yes, and I, well, I, you know, there's, an, there's a passive uh, inclusion approach, and there's an active inclusion approach. Um, you know, I, 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 my interest is in the impact of the Olympics on the world, and I, I just want to say again how terrific the CBC has been in bringing out more than on the podium uh, focus on getting gold. I mean, just terrific. Um, and the point I want to make is that there's an opportunity here because the Olympic is a worldwide event, really, um, it has the opportunity to say, to be actively inclusive. In other words, to be a leader in inclusion. And I, I think there are many people who now uh, would say that the world would be a better place with more equity in, of women everywhere because we need that balance in, in every which way. Um, so there's a tremendous opportunity to be an active influence on that. So yes, I think it's it, because of the opportunity, it's so unique, it would be very helpful. If, yeah. uh, and we shall, should also add women's ski jumping was added for the first yes. time uh, this time. Yeah. At the uh, just uh, clearly uh, another point is that, you know, um, <coughs> The numbers game that De Deanna just talked about doesn't get at the discrimination that goes on against women's sport at the grassroots level. Mm -hmm. You know, Jen mm -hmm. was telling me about her experience of observing. You know, may want to speak mm -hmm. to that, but where women's, where girls' sports are programmed at times that aren't very accommodating, if they're programmed at all. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, it's not just uh, an issue in this part of the world, of course. Uh, in in uh, the Islamic world is a huge issue, like Deanna said, and mm -hmm. they're trying to trying to get around that uh, through cultural sensitivity and stuff. But obviously, women's sport is a huge issue there, and yep. uh, it's something that we can't ignore. That uh, a lot of women are just not encouraged to go into sports. <laughs> I love the stories of the dads of women hockey players who didn't want their daughters playing hockey that now are just the biggest fans. Exactly, you know, yeah. there's transformation yeah. here. <laughs> Marilyn touched on it. Uh, uh, Michael, you're the expert on it. Uh, what's, your, um, what's your opinion on one week in uh, the role of the media so far in the games, uh, both NBC and uh, CBC, which uh, we have access to? <clears throat> well, I tend to take a kind of a long look at it, and it's amazing to me the abundance of, um, of media Olympics now, uh, as opposed to like in the old network TV era, where you got the network's version of the Olympics limited largely to prime time, yeah. no choices. Now I've got three sc screens going. I've got my phone with my CBC mobile app, and I've got my computer with information and interaction with other people. I've got the TV, and the TV, I've got 31 channels on my satellite <laughs> system no that are carrying the Olympics. So the abundance of it is, is fabulous yeah. for, the, for the viewer. It gives viewer choice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer, uh, Marilyn mentioned that she's happy with CBC coverage, that it's been very fair and uh, not just touching on the winners, but the broad spectrum of the stories of the Olympics. How have you found the first week in, of the coverage? Oh, great, great. And what I'm really like, liking and, and have been craving for the last uh, 20 years 
is uh, the capacity for the media to highlight the fourths and the fifths and the eighths mm -hmm. and the twelfths in the way that you just did and to acknowledge it. A lot of the time we're right there, you know, we're right there. And what's the difference between a third and a fourth really? In rowing, you know, you only ever win, not always, but often you'll only win a gold. Yeah. So there's a win and loss thing and that's it. And I just think it's crazy this differentiation between the third and fourth. So right. I think they're doing mm -hmm. a great job. We have a question from uh, our audience. Hi, uh, thank you. Great comments. Um, I'm representing uh, munis municipal programming, uh, recreation and sports programming. I quite liked uh, Deanna's comments about grassroots uh, de development. Uh, what comes to mind is the long-term athlete development program. I like to hear the the panel's views on that program. Um, is there any gaps with that program? Uh, going back to municipal sports and recreation programs, you often hear that the elites. Uh, sorry, the grassroots is at the BC Games level or the Alberta Games level. Uh, I'm from Alberta. Um, being a municipal leader, I feel there is a grassroots level that is uh, is not even being captured. Um, I would call that BC sports level, uh, games level, almost elitist. Uh, it is formulating into the next stages, but there is another level that's being missed. Um, I'd just like to welcome your comments uh, on my feedback to you. Jennifer, you're yeah, actually involved like <laughs> in the in the system. Uh, to first of all, ask Jennifer uh, her opinions because uh, you're actually there in Indiana. Yeah. yeah, well, I was a middle school educator for many years too and coach. And, and so I've always really embraced this idea of the long-term athlete development plan, which is based on this idea of readiness. You know, when are they ready for certain um, certain kinds of training, certain kinds of concepts? And I think if we were operating more along that line of, of readiness, that we would serve our children so much more effectively. I think um, what's missing from that plan, and it's it's a young plan, and it's being embraced, which is great. It's very flattering, right? It, it tells people that uh, it's what coaches were looking for. But what's missing, and which I think we're ad adapting to already, is um, a value stream. You know, so we're teaching them the physical literacy, but then let's teach them that the mental how to focus, how to be disciplined, how to be organized, but then also this values piece. Okay, when are they going to be ready really to, to learn how to pass a ball and not just think about scoring and understand that you're part of a bigger team and, and then even a bigger team and, and the way you're, you know, the commercials are great through the Olympics, thanking their parents, I love that. <laughs> but that's, I think, what's missing. And then also what you talked about with the grassroots, there's this layer that's missing. And it's like we make this leap and differentiation between these kids who are learning and then, oh, you're trying to be some kind of, um, BC level athlete or Olympic athlete um, what about those who just want to improve or play the game or you know and uh, my comment to Marilyn earlier was I see these U11 girls being given the Friday night slot for night league basketball and that's just so metaphorical to me what, why no one wants to get them there <laughs> so right away the support isn't there they don't want to play they're exhausted by Friday they're like 10 year olds girls you know so let's Let's just be the bigger picture and think about kids as kids and not differentiate. Uh, we're down to our last uh, five minutes. I just want to just ask our panel, uh, we'll start with Deanna, just your final thoughts on uh, midweek, uh, midpoint of the games, uh, just uh, the games in general, how, the, how they've hit you uh, subjectively and maybe even objectively, but just your, your overall impression of Sochi uh, halfway through. Well, let me quickly respond here. The LTAD, we need to profile Victoria because the authors of the LTAD are Richard Way and his partner who live in Victoria. Long-term Long athlete development model. And uh, they base that on child development strategy. The key is how do we teach the leaders? That's the key, yeah. right? Sochi, I think it's great. We've got another week. I'm sorry Patrick Chan didn't win the gold medal. We have once again a top, top, top skater who uh, has a silver, but good for him. He made a couple of mistakes this morning. I could hardly watch it. <laughs> I think the ceremonies were fabulous. I think the values that are being communicated through the media are, are, are really good. Love the focus on the families uh, and community. Michael? I'd like to follow up on a theme that Jennifer is a leading advocate. And that's the difference between watching sports and participating in sports. And unfortunately, during the last couple of decades, Stats Canada's figures indicate that overall participation in sports at all age levels, not just youth sports, grown-ups, everything, has declined significantly. People are playing fewer sports. They're less active, more sedentary, and there are all kinds of negatives that come with that. And, and that, to me, means that we're not getting the full message 
out of the Olympics and the sports that are being held up as models because we should be doing and not just watching. Right. Jennifer? Yeah, we've had a conversation about the role of the media, and I think as an athlete, I, I tended to find them just a distraction. But of course, <laughs> there's this huge role, and now I'm in the School of Communication. I want to leverage that meaning, get those messages. I've been really impressed as well with the values that are being communicated, the things that are being highlighted. But I think we need to do a better job of, of helping people understand the value of participation and um, what we can learn from just participating. We don't have to always be striving to Marilyn, you're the non-sports person on the panel, but the Olympics, of <laughs> course. I do swim. Break, uh, break. <laughs> they, not, of course, go across all uh, sectors of society. <laughs> Everybody watches the Olympics. Just your thoughts on the halfway point. Yeah, uh, I'll just add to my colleagues' comments here. Uh, the, the thing that impressed me again with the CBC coverage, and by that I mean it connects all the, the whole country with what's going on in a particular way, underlying the people who are behind the winners, and not only all, all behind the winners, but all of the athletes. And, and uh, if I maybe come full circle and look at the Dufour Le Point family, Maxime, the eldest of the three, uh, was the person who got her sisters into this. Mm -hmm. And I love that the, that, that and, and uh, other instances of real, what, you know, the roots underneath the tree are the life of it. And, and that that's been brought out. I, I really am enjoying it tremendously. And of course, the performances and the ups and downs of competition are, are exciting. Great. I'd like to thank the, the panel, and I think it's been a very uh, great conversation. I think I uh, hope people have uh, enjoyed it. Uh, obviously, uh, everybody brings uh, their own background to this, and uh, it's been very edifying and very uh, uh, enriching to listen to what everybody uh, has to bring to the table here, and I've uh, really enjoyed this, and uh, we'll see you next week. Well, yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's been a, a very good uh, spectacle to this point, and uh, very inspiring in many ways, and uh, I think you're right. A lot of it is, like Michael said, and, and Marilyn brought up is how the media, uh, the prism through how the media presents this to us. And if it's just only the winners, and if it's just that whole own the podium, which I thought it was going to be this time, because I thought because the Maybe. the way CTV and their consortium presented it last time was a little more uh, along the, those lines of uh, look at all the medals we have, which is great. I mean, like Jennifer, this is serious business out there, and we're there to win medals. And if you're sitting at there as a winter nation with one or two at this point, there'd be national soul searching going on, and why mm -hmm. why do we you know suck so badly as a <laughs> as a nation? Instead, everybody feels better when your country wins medals. And, it, and there's a place for everybody in the Olympics and the summer games. You can have the African nations winning, you know, in the track. And, and, and this is for the winners. So everybody has their role uh, to play in the games. And if you fill those roles, if you feel happy about them, and it sort of reverberates right throughout society because the games are just so big. Uh, I, I, and Michael's uh, written widely about this and how this goes beyond just sports. You know, this is uh, society looking at itself in the mirror and the values mm -hmm. that it sees back at them. And I'm happy to see that Canadian values are still there, that the media sort of... Uh, indicates here today that uh, they're pretty happy that it's not just uh, uh, an American style win at all uh, cost. Swagger. Yeah, swagger. The word that's being used, beyond of course, swagger. swagger. Yeah, yeah. Beyond yeah, swagger. Beyond swagger. And I, I was sort of disappointed in the Canadian team uh, who that, that was their sort of message, the leadership group, uh, yeah, including Steve Podbor including leadership. Steve Podborski, yeah, who had sort of brought that, we need the swagger, we need that American style, we're here to win, and I really don't care about anything else. And that was sort of, uh, that was their opening press conference, which sort of took a lot of people aback and by surprise. So, uh, Deanna, did you want to add? Uh, yeah, I was your, just yeah. going to say, I think Steve Podborski was scripted. <laughs> uh, that's not really Steve, but it certainly is some of the other leaders in the Canadian Olympic uh, movement, right? And yeah, I, I'm not sure that that was the best way to begin, but maybe yeah, well, when, it's when your leaders are saying that, how, uh, uh, how do you sort of uh, overcome that? If, if indeed you, if it is something to be overcome, maybe it is something we should be, uh, uh, maybe that should be our attitude. Well, I think we should pay attention to our own values as Canadians. You know, we have great values as can I'm talking about personal values we did a values assessment uh, in Canada five years ago hope to do another one but you know if we say when these things we don't need to take the leadership from something that doesn't feel right uh, and I think uh, it's it's really good to, s to say uh, to oneself in as an observer uh, you know does this is this does this f how does it you know you get that little twinge yeah. what's the twinge about uh, so I would invite Canadians really to, to, to see themselves as a part of all this and not pay attention to the swagger. It's actually a bigger 
a bigger val the Olympics is much more valuable with all in than focus on three people. You know, it's a, and if you talk about investment in sport as a value, too, as important, it's not just to have the, us perform well, which is important, but also what does it impact on the country and what is it saying about us? I think that's yes, very important. Like the question that was brought up, I think we have seen, seen it here uh, with uh, Jennifer's group in the 90s, the Olympic rowing success suddenly rowing clubs are full of young kids, right? And that's the true value, you know, when you actually see your uh, people doing things at the top level, it, the bottom level grows. And uh, that's, you know. that's the on the other hand. When you've got winners, kids want to participate. Exactly. So. And next Excellent. week in the same forum, we will answer all of the other questions <laughs> yeah. about the Sochi Olympics, okay? Great, right. Thank, uh, thanks to the panel, and uh, we'll see you next week. Okay. okay. okay.